The first session is Fireside Chat, and we'll be talking about challenges of building business in a diverse yet connected world. It's an honor to invite on stage Priyanka Gill, co-founder of Good Glam World, in conversation with Rohil Amin, Senior Editor, Exchange for Media and BW Business World. I'll request you all to kindly put your hands together and welcome both of them on the stage. Thank you, uh, Priyanka. Uh, we had a chat outside as well. And, you know, I'm also fascinated because I'm also talking to a journalist, you know, somewhere, right? And uh, the topic we have is absolutely bang on on this forum, uh, challenges of building business in a diverse yet connected world. You know, I mean, we are inundated with information day in and day out. The time you begin your day to the time you go to bed, you have to address and uh, you're overloaded with information. In this uh, context, in this reality, building a business is not easy. And as we know, the Good Glam Group, hyper-local, hyper-present, uh, I mean, it's not easy to deal with that diverse, uh, you know, uh, universe, uh, the expanse that it has. How do you ensure that yet you build a business that does well, um, uh, has a great brand recall, has has profitability inbuilt. I mean, how do you how do you ensure that? Firstly, thanks for having you, uh, Rohil and Dr. Batra. Uh, thank you so much uh, for uh, inviting me back on the eForum stage. You know, I think uh, inclusion, diversity, building for a connected world, uh, it's such an important thing uh, for all of us today, right? Because all businesses that we build are omni-channel by design. Because we as human beings consume uh, content in different ways. We still will read the newspaper. We will, of course, spend a lot of time on our phones, on social media. We will still watch television. So it's like an omni-channel approach to life. When you go to shop, we'll go and buy at the Kirana store. We'll go and buy at a mall. We'll go and buy at uh, a multi-brand retailer as well. So because we live in an omni-channel fashion, our companies, our brands, uh, people who build for us also have to keep that in mind. And that's something that we at the Good Glam Group have been doing pretty much from day one. Because the story of how we came together is actually an omnichannel story. Uh, I started life as a digital media journalist. Uh, I started a, a media platform called PopXO. My, uh, the group co-founder and CEO, Darpan Sangvi, he started as a brand owner with My Glam, our other co-founder, she started as a parenting platform owner with Baby Chakra, Naya. And all of us came together to build the Good Glam Group, which is a conglomerate of beauty personal care brands, digital media platforms, and influencer marketing companies, where we reach pretty much most, more than half of India in any given month through the media platforms that we have. We have 60,000 points of sale where we sell offline too. So selling online, offline, reaching people online, offline, all of that are kind of the hallmarks of living in a hyper-connected world and building for an omni-channel audience and for an omni-channel market. Right, you know, you were also one of the earlier uh, brands that uh, looked at uh, content to commerce, you know, uh, and you mastered it and that's the engine that you brought to the Good Glam group and then the story, how it unfurled. Uh, how has the content to commerce journey been? Oh, and how has it panned out over the years? Uh, if you could just take us through that. You know, uh, being a media entrepreneur is not easy. And of course, we have one of India's foremost media entrepreneurs who's sitting in the room right in front of us and he will attest to that. It's not easy because it's very difficult to monetize, right? finding uh, uh, sponsors all the time, trying to get sponsored content, it's just not easy. But media is very good at one thing. We are very good at telling people what they should know about. We are very good at attracting audiences organically. So that is a superpower that media has, especially in a country like India. So uh, as a media entrepreneur, that's something that I recognize. I also knew it's hard to make money, right? And the making money part of monetizing your audience is something that commerce does really well. So they know exactly how to make the products, they know exactly how to sell those products, and their big challenge is reaching audiences, right? So when you put media and commerce together, or when you put content and commerce together, you're literally solving for each other's big pain points. So when MyGlam and PopExo merged in August 2020, we 
got down the cost of customer acquisition for my glam to pretty much nothing. That was the beginning of the Good Glam Group. Based on that kind of hockey stick that we discovered through content to commerce, we raised $250 million in one year. We went and bought 11 companies, and then we built the Good Glam Group. So the Good Glam Group story actually shows how content and commerce can come together at scale to solve each other's pain points and really build something that is of lasting value, not only for us as a group, but also for an audience. I have to ask you this. See, everyone is attempting this uh, formula, trying to understand the content to commerce. And you see the mushrooming of uh, agencies, people, companies in this space. But yet, there's a secret sauce, uh, which, uh, I mean, you, you kind of use. What is that? I mean, what makes your content click? And what are the ingredients that really make it sticky in that sense? You know, uh, I've been asked many questions, and this is probably the first time I've actually been asked this question, so thank you for that. Um, there's no secret sauce, to be honest. It's a matter of luck, timing. It's a, you know, a overnight success, 10 years in the making is how I define my journey, how I define the Good Glam Group's journey, Darpan's journey, Naya's journey. All of us have been doing it for such a long time. So we've literally been kind of honing our own companies and our craft for us to actually come together at that perfect moment for the formation of the Good Glam Group. But having said that, there's something to be said for scale. So I'm also the CEO of the Good Media Company within the group, where we have Pop Exo, Scoop Whoop, Miss Malini, Tweak, Baby Chakra, five of India's largest digital media platforms, so 200 million monthly active users, right? So when you're able to do this at scale, and not only do we have media, we have the brand side, where we have around 11 uh, million odd transacting users that basically buy our products. So when you're able to put media at scale in partnership with commerce at scale, so content at scale and commerce at scale, that's actually the secret sauce. So people try doing it, but then I think the missing ingredient probably is going to be, are we doing it big enough? And are we actually uh, doing it where we're reaching a large audience? I think that's the problem that uh, sometimes is faced. Absolutely. And I know you named the companies at the good media company that you have, Poplexo, Scoop Poop, Miss Malini, Baby Chakra, Tweak India. I mean, there's so much, and each has its own DNA. So the role is complex. So how do you navigate this complexity of the role and then the, the larger role of the good glam group? Uh, is it easy? I mean, how do you actually manage it? You know, I spent the first, uh, uh, Poplexo was my first job, and... Uh, I was just asked what was my first job. I gave myself my first salary. So I, was, uh, I, I haven't had a boss before this. So I don't know any better. So for the first kind of 10 years of my career, I went about kind of trying to build a media company. And we had 200 people, mainly female at PopXO, and really trying to understand what does it take to actually build the nuts and bolts of a company together. So that's almost like, an, it's like a training ground. It was my training phase in a way. Then the Good Glam Group happened, and then we bought one media platform, another media platform, and suddenly people who were my competition in the media world, they were all kind of, all the teams were basically working together as the Good Media Company. And we literally took principles that work at each of the platforms, and we tried to do this transfer of knowledge and experience across the platforms. And the biggest thing that I think that we've managed to accomplish is convince the teams that all of us are the Good Media Company, all of us are distinct platforms. We have our points of view, but we are also still one. And what we offer to the market is something very unique. Like just yesterday, we were there at the launch of Booze 98 and TV. All Devita had to do was speak to me saying, hey, can you be there? And because of that, three of India's largest digital media platforms turned up at her event. And it just took one phone call to basically get it done. So this network effect of having different media companies that speak to different audiences is extremely valuable, not only for us as a group, but also for the brands uh, that we work for. It kind of comes together as a big force, right? That's what you mean. You know, uh, you have also described your journey from the journalist to the current role and position you have as roller coaster. I mean, what exactly, why exactly a roller coaster? I mean, uh, a lot of us are entrepreneurs in the room. Where we, uh, even if we haven't been entrepreneurs in the true sense, we've also been entrepreneurs in the jobs that we have. And it's hard. You know, there's no other way to define what you do because you're really letting go of any safety net that 
you might have and say, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, I'm going to do this, and I will only succeed when I succeed. For the longest time, it's ups and downs. I've had investors who walked out on me. I started 2020 with uh, my Series C investor walking out at the last moment, wondering what to do. Pandemic happened, everything shut down. Everyone was at, was at home, having no money, not knowing how salaries would come. And then suddenly in August 2020, the merger happened. And then you, uh, a few months later, you had the Good Glam Group. Seven months, right? Seven months. So like literally from one point where you're wondering how are you going to kind of, what are we going to do right now? I remember those days where I had to do a, t a Zoom. My first Zoom town hall was with 200 of my teammates saying, hey, guys, I'm so sorry. We will not be able to pay salaries for this month. And I know it's a pandemic, but you have to just basically stay by us. But the good thing was every one of those 200 people survived, and they're still with us today. So I mean, a roller coaster is the way it is, but I think it's also once you get used to it, that's pretty much all you want to do. So I look forward to the adrenaline rush. Things go wrong. You go fix it. So you kind of, it becomes part of your DNA and your psyche. And uh, that's what keeps life exciting. Absolutely. You know, so there's one perception about this, uh, the good media company, which is that uh, does it make content only for uh, the internal stakeholders? Uh, how does it work with external brands? Say, for example, there's another beauty product, you know, and, and can they work with oh, uh, good media? How does it uh, kind of, what is this relationship internal and external like at the good media company? I think it's a great question, right? And it's also a very fair question, to be honest. So we are independent media platforms at the end of the day. If Tweak doesn't want to do a particular story, they will not do it. And I can't do it. other ones who are the content owners and they decide what happens on their brand. Similarly for Tweak, uh, for Scoop Poop or Miss Malini or even the Pop Exo editorial team for that uh, matter. And we work with brands across the board. I just gave an example of the Woo event that we did where we went and covered uh, the launch of their uh, big TV, right? So, and we work with all beauty brands as well. Uh, Mintra's beauty content is primarily at some point, we're creating a almost 200 videos for them, right? Uh, there's a very large uh, media platform owned by a very large media uh, conglomerate. We run it for them, right? So we work with brands across the board. There's no brand that we will not work with. We are independent companies at the end of the day. Of course, we do work with our good brands and we work, uh, we create content for them as well, but that's like any other media company would do, right? So that independence is, is fiercely maintained, especially at an editorial level. And even when working with brands who are not within the good brands uh, uh, kind of ambit, we I mean, really look out and we search for them. How, most of my job today is putting together decks where we can get partnerships with other brands. Because monetizing is the lifeblood of what you need to do as a company. And the Good Media Co. monetizes when you work with other brands. So it's, uh, it's good to be back in the game. That's why it's great to be back at physical events like this. So you're actually, again, networking with people and telling them uh, exactly what you do. Well, thanks for sharing. I think uh, there's clarity. A lot of there were questions, and thanks for sharing uh, this. Also, you know, there's a significant investments that uh, uh, you are making in your video and digital uh, assets. Uh, how would it impact your current content to commerce strategy? Uh, where are you headed? Where do you see on uh, say from uh, two years from now? What is the vision that you have for your content to? you know, commerce. You know, um, 2021 was a fantastic year, right? Especially if you were an entrepreneur. That was a time when investors from across the world were literally pouring money onto companies. And uh, luckily, we were at the top of that cycle and we managed to raise uh, a decent war chest then to kind of weather the, uh, the slightly less robust funding scenario that we are in right now. I'm trying to avoid the word winter. I, I will use that word yeah. in my question. So um, because of that, we were able to put our digital media companies together. And when we announced the Good Media Co, we said that we'd invest $5 million in our media investments over the course of the next two years, which is exactly what we've done. We uh, invested, uh, we acquired Tweak India at that point. Uh, we've made significant investments into video. We are on the verge of opening our first physical office after the pandemic on Monday. It's like a 15, 20,000 square foot uh, space that has five studios where three units will shoot all the time. 
content not only for our media platform, sponsored content for other brands, and of course for good brands as well. So uh, we produce almost 10,000 pieces of content any given month across different medium. We have a team of 200 people who are in, in the Good Media Co itself that's creating all this content. So it's very exciting to be in this environment where you get to play with different brands, where you get to play with different mediums and uh, do it at scale. So our investments are of course significant, but because of that, we have 200 million monthly active users who generate over 2 billion impressions in, in, in any given month. Half of India's social media audience comes to a Good Media Co platform in any given month, which is immense reach. Absolutely, these are humongous numbers. You know, you spoke about funding and let me put that, that actually we call it the winter of funding and luckily enough, the phase you've seen was the golden era of funding, right? But that has shifted. What is leading to this winter of funding? Because you know, you understand the space. I think I have to ask you this. And is it here to stay? Uh, you also refer to it as correction, I also. Um, uh, will refer to this, but what is leading to it? Will it correct itself, settle somewhere where we have uh, the golden days back again? Look, that was an aberration. It was that uh, black swan event or a white swan event in this case that happens once in a very rare uh, blue moon, right? What we are now is back to sanity, back to reality, right? This is the normal course of uh, life where a strong idea, a strong team will find funding, and something that might be more speculative will not find funding. That is reality, actually. I think we all got spoiled by that effervescence that happened at that time. So now we are kind of falling back on tropes like, uh, say, a funding winter. But I think it is uh, a back to sanity moment. Uh, the macro markets really impact how the a startup funding market behaves, right? So if you see a contraction in the, in the macro uh, scenario, suddenly you'll see the funds, uh, the LPs who invest in the funds, they will pull back. If LPs pull back, then the funds will have to pull back. So there's a lot of macro stuff happening right now. So I think uh, India, anyway, we are seeing corrections at the moment. It's been a good uh, run for us recently. And uh, if there is a shining star in the economic scenario right now, it has to be India. Like we've been saying that the next three decades belong to India, which is why it's extremely exciting to be in a room like this, to be in India, building in India, and now today building for in India for the world, right? So uh, as an entrepreneur, it's extremely exciting times. I think the funding cycles repeat themselves. I have been through maybe one, two, three hyper funding cycles. I've been through three really low funding cycles as a result of it. So once you've done it long enough, you realize it is cyclical. What goes up also comes down, and it goes up back again. And you live in that hope, and I think that is the definition of being an entrepreneur. And I think India per se as a market does not have those challenges. These are external challenges that we have to absorb maybe momentarily, right? Um, you know, uh, a lot of, I mean, read a lot about uh, going public, and let me ask you here that, what is the timeline, real, real timeline in mind for going public? Look, we've always said publicly, I mean, pun, in, maybe not intended, is that we are looking to list uh, in the public markets in the next couple of years. Um, it really, uh, there's so many things that go into timing that right, and that's literally one of the most important decisions you make as a company, time getting the markets right uh, for when you do want to list. Uh, the macro situation has to be uh, robust. There has to be a good, strong tailwind behind us. The company numbers, of course, have to be kind of where we would like them to be, which is where the path that we are on right now. So there are so many kind of different things in the mix that have to kind of come to one place for us to actually have that date in mind. But yeah, the next couple of years is what we've been, we, what we've said in the past, and that's exactly where we are holding it to. Right. Uh, journalist, entrepreneur, investor, what defines you the most? Mother, to be honest, and not a cliche, actually. I was just telling someone, my son's turning 18 in the next, uh, in Jan next year, and my daughter's 13, and uh, I mean, she's as old as uh, PopEx or the brand, and she's grown up with PopEx. I mean, she's known, only known a world where the brand existed. So I think I literally do a lot of what I do is because I, my kids seem to get inspired by it, and uh, that would be my 
strongest definition. And of course, I speak to entrepreneur, I speak to uh, many different things, but yeah, I think I guess mother. I will open this forum to some questions, but let me ask you one more question. We all have 24 hours, you know? And you did all this in 24 hours, and then you balance your life. I mean, I mean how do you manage this work-life balance? And I also read that you don't believe in work-life balance. What is You have been like? reading up. No, I don't believe in work-life balance because I do think it's a myth. All of us, uh, as you said, have the same 24 hours in the day. Uh, Companies much larger than ours have been built in the same 24 hours. Uh, people have done unimaginably large things with the same 24 hours. So I think all of us, I, mean, I treat it as a privilege and I try packing into it as much as I physically can uh, because that's what actually drives me. And uh, what I'm doing at that moment becomes super important. So I'm sitting here talking to you. This is the most important thing that I'm doing right now. There are people who are building walls in the Goodlam office I'm, I, I could be worrying about. Uh, my daughter's uh, sitting at home. Is she, ha has she had a lunch yet? I could be worrying about that as well. But I choose not to because I'm sitting, I'm enjoying this conversation with you. So being able to hyper-focus in the moment that you're in and really give it your 100% and then quickly move on to the next thing, I think once you master that, it becomes easier to switch hats uh, in the course of the day. Wonderful. I mean, that, that's really all of our discipline and priority. You know, uh, influencer marketing is something, uh, you know, you know so much about and so you have hands-on experience of that. And we recently saw threads coming up and everyone rushing to it. Uh, let me ask you, I mean, how have you, I mean, uh, what is your opinion of people going to new platforms? Uh, how does it change the influencer marketing space? Uh, has Threads been able to add a new value to this ecosystem? You know, it's a funny story. So back in 2017, uh, Nike, no, Puma was a large client of PopXO. And uh, they wanted to break the Limca world of records for the most number of women doing the plank at the same time. So they came to us and said, let's do this campaign together. And as part of that, they wanted 800 influencers. There were no influencers back in the day. 800 influencers to also take part in that campaign. So at that time, all we had was WhatsApp. Me, my WhatsApp, and two other people and their WhatsApp managed to get 800 influencers to take part in this Puma campaign. And we went to Bombay. We, were the, we broke the world record with them. That was the beginning of my influencer marketing journey. I remember my tech team coming back to me and saying, Peachy, what are you doing? Like, you're trying to do this on WhatsApp. You can use technology to do this. And that was the beginning of Plixo, the influencer marketing company that uh, we founded uh, then. And uh, so I remember going to all the offices in the country saying, hey, influencer marketing is going to be a thing. CMOs looking at me very skeptically. What is she talking about? And what is an influence? And why is it going to matter? And at that time, I truly believed, and I think you have this, I mean, you need to have this ability to really believe in what you say. I really believe that influencer marketing is going to be the next big thing. And thankfully, I was, uh, I was, I was right at that point. And uh, today, you see influencers are the way that brands communicate with their audiences. And that's going to be the way for a very long time. That's not going to change. Social media platforms, I think, will come and go, right? Millions of people for one, two days really jumped on the platform. And like what you said was you it got was in there. FOMO, yes. FOMO, and you got there, you didn't know what to do. So I'm really hoping they kind of find their way. Uh, they've, uh, like our channels grew really explosively uh, on the Threads account. But now I think my content team's a thing. That's another distribution platform on which they have to post content now. So yeah, I think Threads is exciting. Uh, it'll be interesting to see what uh, is actually becomes of the platform itself. I think they'll have to do some innovations along to keep the audiences uh, engaged on that platform too. Because you, again, 24 hours in the day, how many platforms can you right. use? Also in the uh, ecosystem of in influencer marketing, uh, I think platforms also will saturate themselves beyond a point of in, in terms of their offerings. How would a new platform be needed, you know? I mean, what will gr give rise to a next Twitter, a next uh, Instagram? Do you think it will be the forces outside that will dictate those terms or? You know, I strongly believe that uh, uh, social media started as a response to uh, the millennial generation, of which I, I'm, I guess the, the oldest millennial that is there. Uh, I lost touch with my friends who went school and college because I didn't grow up with a mobile phone. That was Facebook, right? And Facebook basically grew out of that. 
millennials have this impulse to want to tell the world about who they are. Our identity is, uh, we find identity when we express it to other people. That was Instagram, right? Now I look at my son and I look at kind of my daughter who are both kind of Gen Z and beyond. They don't have these needs. They grew up in a world with a mobile phone. My daughter's changed three schools in the past in her schooling career so far. She's in touch with all her friends. She does not need a Facebook in her life to meet her friends. Similarly, my son does not feel the need to tell the world who he is through the photographs that he's taking. He just wants to connect with his friends one-to-one, -one, and he uses Instagram like, like we use WhatsApp. So I think generations change, the impulses and the desires of the generations change, and new forms of uh, communication technologies or social media platforms adapt to meet those changes. So to your answer to your question would be, whoever understands Gen Z and beyond, and what does this generation want, they are the ones who will innovate the next platform that actually becomes large. TikTok did it because short attention spans, we couldn't co concentrate too much. It caught onto that, short form video was born, that was TikTok, right? So really finding that niche in the audience demand and building it at scale, that's what, it is not going to be another social media platform in my estimation. I see some hands going up, but let me ask one question and then I'll come to you. I always think that there is a third side to a discussion, which is the audience, you know. Uh, a lot of people look up to you. Uh, they are uh, inspired by your success story. And what is your advice to them? And let me, before that, uh, put the quote that I read about you, that if you have an idea, just take a shot. Just, have a, uh, just having a plan doesn't make anything happen ever. How much do you actually uh, kind of, you know, urge them to follow this? 2,000%. I have so many friends who have so many ideas. And if you don't execute it, it's just an idea, it's just a plan. And I think a lot of us get stuck in that loop of trying to perfect the plan before we take the leap to execute it. Because it's scary to take that leap, right? Planning is comfort, planning is just on a piece of paper or an Excel spreadsheet. No risk is involved in planning. The first element of risk comes in when you actually take that first step, and that is really scary. And so most people don't do that. So my idea, my kind of, I mean, to your point, advice is, if you have an idea, just do it. I mean, it doesn't have to be 100% fully formed. It can be half-baked. You learn while you're doing it. I made 10,000 mistakes in my journey so far. I'll make 10,000 more, and I'm happy to make them because each mistake teaches you something, and that's how you evolve. Uh, success, uh, failure is not trying, right? As long as you're trying, you are still succeeding. And if you don't stop, you will ultimately succeed. So yeah, just take the leap, just do it, it's okay. So it's not the era of Mr. Perfectionist or a mixed perfectionist, let's just do it. Just do it, I, this is a line that resonates, so. Um, all right, let me come to some questions. So please, uh, and can, could you please also introduce yourself? Uh, can we give a microphone to the gentleman, please? Thank you, thank you, Ruhel. And Priyanka, you, you won a fan today evening, today afternoon. A um, couple of, you know, before the question, the question is very pointed, but just a couple of points. Uh, you've mastered the art of handling stress and remaining young, therefore, okay? Um, I appreciate the point about plunging in because that's the only way you can create a world record. And uh, we have that in common. I've created one as a young entrepreneur 23 years back. And that happened in the spur of a moment in two minutes. I flew down with the chief minister and then, you know, 170 countries noticed what I was doing. The question I have is that point in time in your life when you decided to raise $250 million, Okay, um, could you just run us through where you were in that journey? It was the appropriate time, 2021, but what exactly was that, that idea or the dream? What is that idea or the dream that clicked and got you that? You that know, function? honestly, the credit for that will go to my co-founder, Darpan Sangvi. So he is one of the most dynamic human beings that I've met, and again, I'm not just saying it for the sake of saying, I do genuinely believe that. So I think when we realize that PopExo and MyGlam can solve for cost of customer acquisition, and that is the single biggest pain point of any brand that you want to build, right? You can get everything right, you can optimize for all the cost, but you have to keep spending money to acquire your next customer. It's a, it's a race to the bottom, 
right? So it doesn't work. So if you're able to solve for the biggest pain point of brand building, which is CAC, and you do, do it through content, that was the first kind of light bulb that went on. Second was, we, uh, PopExo had, at that time, had 60 million uh, uh, monthly active users, right? And we were barely using any of that audience to scale MyGlam. And it, MyGlam was still kind of, kind of zooming up like a hockey stick. We realized there's so much unused capacity uh, within even the reach that PopExo has that other brands can basically be sustained by that. I think those two, three things happen, and the first one, we thought this looks like a fluke, it can't be real. Second month is, oh my God, I mean, two months in a row is not. By the time we hit our third month into it, I think Darpan was firing on all cylinders, and uh, he managed to excite uh, or capture the imagination of that whole generation of investors. And of course, the funders happen in tranches, and maybe I think two or maybe three tranches is basically how it happened. But one success basically fed into another, right? And uh, we made some very aggressive moves. We bought 11 companies in one year. I mean, every single marketing uh, strategy professor in every business school in the world is going to tell you M&As don't work. And here we are sitting on the positive end of 12 successful M&As. All of them happened in the past uh, two to three years, right? So it kind of bucking the, tri the, bucking the tide in so many ways, beating uh, conventional advice that would come your way and l choosing to ignore it. So it was like, I mean, I look back at that time and I mean, it was, a, it was a magical time because everything going right for you does not happen often, but when it does, you've got to double, quadruple down and just literally run with it as fast as you can and recognize that moment that you're in it and really enjoy that. So, is, so sorry. Oh, okay, yes. Sure. Nice to meet you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Uh, all right, Ravin is here. Uh, I had more questions, but thank you so much, Priyanka. My pleasure. Uh, really, really enjoy talking to you. Thanks for your time. Can thank you so much. Can we have a round of applause? For her? Uh, can I request both of you to get a picture together? And to show our gratitude to Rupali for, uh, of course, I would like to call on stage. G. Rupali Fernandez, Chief Revenue Officer, ABP Network, to kindly join us on the stage to felicitate Priyanka for her valuable time here. No, Ruhil doesn't, uh, is not in the habit of getting uh, all these goodie bags since he's the one mostly handing them out. Okay. But I'll take it from, from the office. 